It took a few people by surprise, I think. <laughs> it was all just outrageously funny and wonderful. <laughs> we were excited. We were really having fun making the show. It's fantastic to have co-written and been involved with a programme which people still talk about, which has words like groundbreaking, <laughs> seminal attached to it. It seems to have actually just hit some kind of vein that uh, I can't really explain. Brilliant! <laughs> you were on, you know, on the cusp of, of something. Definitely you were aware of that. We were lucky enough with the young ones to be at the forefront of the movement. I, I think that new comedy, alternative comedy movement, changed the game. As I remember, there were stand-up comedy was the sort of northern working man's club circuit. The dominant TV comedy was, uh, was exemplified by the, the programme The Comedians, which uh, Granada provided for ITV Network. And it was made up entirely of, almost entirely, of, of white working class comics from, from the north. You know, the Bernard Mannings and Les Dawson's and Charlie Williams. Telling very, very mainstream and in many cases very reactionary jokes but that was absolutely part of the culture at the time and the so-called alternative comedy arose partly as a kind of response to that but not in any deliberate sense. The northern comedy thing, northern comedy has always been a very strong uh, element of British entertainment and the working men's club circuit was much more vibrant in the north than it was in the south uh, just because of the social composure, composition of, the, uh, of those communities. There was no theory, movement, program or whatever about so-called alternative comedy. It was a kind of coincidental coming together of vaguely like-minded people. The defining moment was the, the comedy store, you know, which was the only comedy club in Britain um, opening. That was the sort of the, you know, the first rumblings of the revolution. It was a different crowd of people for a start which set them apart and it was it was an exciting movement live on stage. It was a strip club, it had a real atmosphere of danger kind of thing, you know, you could get drink, it was open until 4am and these, these were things that were unheard of. It was a sort of punk version of um, theatre, so, so whereas punk was like, here are three chords, now go out and form a band. <laughs> this was, here's a microphone in a club, you know, do stand-up comedy. The first night that I went to the comedy store, uh, Rick and Aid uh, appeared as 20th Century Coyote, but Rick also appeared as the poet on his own, Vanessa. Rick Mail had a character called Rick, who was a poet, uh, a, a really dreadful poet, who used to stand up and do poems about Vanessa Redgrave and then get angry when people laughed at him. This is an angry love poem that I've written, and it's called Vanessa. <laughs> So that was, that was a sort of embryonic version of the character of Rick. And Nigel Planer um, had a character called Neil. She said... He was a... who wore a, a sort of woolly hat and played the guitar very badly and was a, a bit of an old hippie. You're as good in <laughs> I mean, I was the MC there, and I'd been performing, but I'd been performing by myself, you know. I didn't know anybody else had the same ideas as me, and it was through the comedy store opening that I first started to meet, first of all, Keith Allen, uh, Tony Allen, the people, Andy De La Torre, and then slightly later on, uh, Rick and Adrian, and then uh, uh, Peter... Peter Richardson and Nigel playing it. Nigel and Peter appeared as uh, Outer Limits, but Nigel did Neil separately on his own. I was in a double act with Peter Richardson. Um, we called ourselves The Outer Limits after the, um, the TV series that was on at the time. 
a sort of not a sci-fi TV series, The Outer Limits. Black BBC Two, welcome please for The Outer Limits! We did a lot of sort of sci-fi movie spoof stuff and really crap mime. We did a lot of crap mime like blood coming out of necks like that and really bad door opening mime in, uh, in shabby old suits. And um, my character Neil was in that act. What's your name? Uh, Neil. Neil. As was uh, P Peter Richardson's character Ken, the photographer, who, who, who photographed women's fallopian tubes. But the other thing that I think that was crucial was that there were already the first generation of kind of producers and directors in television who were university or college educated. And these people up until then, they were interested. They probably shared some of the ideas that we shared. How can we civilise it? That's the word they use, which is a very inflammatory word to use these days. But uh, they thought, we'll civilise this and get it on television. I don't think they succeeded completely in civilising it, but they got it on television. You'd go and see uh, Nigel Planer do the embryonic Neil, and, of course, Rick was there, of course, Dawn and Jennifer were there. You saw all of these comedians, but I think the real, the real uh, talent that Paul had was actually to get a script out of them and to get a project that they were interested in doing. As a very baby producer, I'd never produced a show of my own at all before, and I was given this opportunity to produce Boom Boom Out Go The Lights. And in my ignorance and stupidity, I was determined to be very dogmatic and very clear about what I wanted. And uh, A, that was a stupid thing to be because that's not how you produce. You have to produce much more diplomatically and cooperatively. And B, I made a bad editorial judgment anyway because I looked at these two acts that were the core of the Comedy Store performance, uh, 20th Century Coyote, Rick and Aid, and Outer Limits, Nigel and Peter. And I came to a view that uh, Rick, as the poet, was the money, and, and Nigel as Neil was the money, and that what they were doing together, it wasn't I didn't like Peter or Aid, it was that what they were doing together wasn't as funny in that first boom boom. So in the first boom boom, Rick appeared doing the poet on his own and Nigel appeared doing Neil on his own. By the time we did the second boom boom, I already wanted uh, to use Outer Limits and Coyote as a double act as well as, uh, and Adrian, not the happiest money, but he did it, and subsequently I hope I'm right in saying we've made it up. I met Rick Mail and um Aid Edmondson, when I was in my last year at school, they were my father's students at, at Manchester University. Um, and I think I'd met them at various parties and things, and, and I was friends with Rick. And then I went off to university and didn't see them for a bit and met up with them again when I left university. Rick, Rick and I had already had um, the idea um, for the young ones, and we were sort of sitting around thrashing it out in... Um, in a pub called the Old Red Lion, which was a theatre pub that I had the job of, of running the theatre. The great thing about the project that they chose to do was it was about young people and about rebellious young people at a university, who were students at a university. And again, there hadn't been anything like that before. So it was very interesting that when they chose what they wanted to write about, that that was the area, the area that they knew so well because they'd all just been students a few years ago. We were just out of university ourselves, so we, we were very close to student days and we were reminiscing about the people we'd lived with who used to label their, you know, their sausage in the fridge and, you know, shout if they thought someone had eaten their yoghurt and, um, and just the, the filth and squalor that we used to live in as well. I remember my grandmother coming to stay with me at, at university and finding a rugby ball in her bed that had somehow got in there and... It was it was just all pretty grim and um, and recent. So we were talking about these characters, and at the same time we were we were sort of uh, lamenting the fact that stand up comedy didn't transfer properly to television, and we tried to think of um, the formats which genuinely belonged on television, and the only two things we could really think of were the nature documentary and the sitcom. And since it, we obviously weren't going <laughs> to do a nature documentary, a, a sitcom seemed the obvious thing to do. The thing is, because we were sort of young and arrogant, we didn't think, oh, my God, you know, we're doing a sitcom on the BBC. They paid us £300 each um, for the, in the first series per script. <laughs> and, uh, and then I think it went up to £500 each for the second series. So at the time, it wasn't quite, you know, give up the day job. Well, that, I mean, maybe by the second series, because we were doing stand-up and tours and things as well. When Rick and I had had the idea, we 
we went to Paul Jackson and said, we've had this idea and this is what it is. It's four students in a house. It's the character, it's the character of Rick and, you know, it's basically using the two double acts and Alexi Sale. And, we, you know, we didn't really tell him much about it before he sort of said, you know, I want to see what it looks like on paper. You know, I'll, I'll get you some money. Can you, can you write a pilot? Rick and Lisa said to me one day, uh, look, would you mind if we brought another writer in? And I said, no, not at all, actually. I think you need one. Again, I was an inexperienced producer, otherwise I'd have put another writer in already by this point. They said, we've got this bloke we knew at university. He was a year below us at university, uh, but he's a prolific writer. He wrote about 18 or 20 plays and had them produced while he was at uni. Uh, and he's very good on structure. Ben came on board. We just, you know, rang him up and went, oh, our friend Ben's doing it as well. And he went, OK, fine, whatever, you know. He, he was great. He was... He was very easy going about it. Comedy and everywhere else. Let's try and get together and get rid of it. My name's Ben Elton. Goodbye. We had a Sunday dinner, I remember, lunch, and um, introduced me to Ben. And I said, yeah, absolutely, if you guys like him and you think he can help. And he undoubtedly did help. I mean, the moment Ben had input, I don't think we'd ever have got 12 written just with Rick and Lisa. But he, he was not the writer. It was very much a three-handed writing. They all brought different lights and shades. It, it's quite difficult to identify who brought what, to be honest. But working as a threesome, they worked very well together. He said to us, I don't want you to worry about budgets. I don't want you to worry about technical constraints. Just write what's in your imagination. And if we can't do it, then I'll tell you at a later date. What that resulted in was a script that didn't know what it couldn't do. And I think that's one of the reasons why The Young Ones was the way it was, because certainly on that first pilot episode, they didn't know what you could and couldn't achieve with television cameras in television studios. So they wrote what you could argue actually was an unshootable script. As I explained, we then got two days to shoot it and more money than we normally would, and we made it shootable. They then came to me as writers and said, what should we not do? You know, we're obviously stretching the boundaries here. We didn't realise when I talked to my team and the team said, no, that's what makes it funny. Let them do whatever they want to do. And we'll worry about it afterwards. If we at any point have to say to them, we just can't do that, let's worry about it then. We never said that to them. We'd have a meeting and thrash out the ideas for each of the episodes. And then um, Ben would go off and write some pages by himself and Rick and I usually work together. Um, and of course, in pre-computer days, there was a lot of, you know, swearing and tipex and, and handwriting, to be honest. I think that the first drafts were handwritten. And then we'd meet up again, the three of us would meet up and uh, share, share our pages with each other. <clears throat> and, um, and Ben would sometimes insist on reading his aloud and he had a very loud voice, so we'd make it, sometimes we made him go and sit in the next room. <laughs> because <laughs> he, he was so deafening and he'd act them all out. So we'd suddenly end up with almost enough material for um, two episodes or one and a half episodes. I always remember there was a line in the script where two people were having a conversation and uh, one of them said, I wish I was a fly on the wall. Sometimes I really wish that I was a fly on the wall. And then we cut to, the script said, we cut to a fly on the wall. <laughs> Who are you? Uh, we're just the uh, fly-on-the-wall documentary film crew, OK, love? Well, of course, you look at that, and as a director, you think, how am I going to achieve that? Or my favourite little sequence um, was that a carrot and a chip were dancing in the sink. How am I going to achieve that? Actually, the way we achieved it was quite pathetic, but I think full of charm. But what it taught me, actually, was never say we can't do that, because most things are doable. The interesting thing about the writing was that they didn't have the traditional conceptions of what television was all about, and as a director, neither should I. And I had to embrace everything that they said. Oh, that was really pretty bad, Rick. <laughs> bad for society when the kids start to get into it. I can't stress how much it's down to writing, that kind of thing. You know, you can, you can clean up stuff in editing, for sure, and you can try and make it slicker and faster, but if you don't have the material in the first place, then you won't have shot it. So um, it's impossible to make it slicker and faster unless it comes out of the writing. And a lot, the fact that uh, two of the writers were performers also helped as well. So they kind of knew what to do from both sides of the tracks like that. When we first started out, we said, um, we said two things to Paul Jackson. One, uh, which apparently everyone says in the beginning which is that they don't want a studio audience and the other was that we wanted 10 days of rehearsal time or two weeks rehearsal time and um, we 
I think we recorded a dress run without an audience to see what it was like and it was completely flat and especially as um, as most of the actors were actually stand-up comedians and, and live performers they didn't really know how to perform except to a live audience and it, and in terms of timing uh, it you know it threw everyone's timing out so we reverted to having an audience and when we tried rehearsing for 10 days people started getting bored with the original joke and the script and changing it and sort of losing the first laugh and getting a bit stale. Often, as would happen on a set, an idea, actually it's, what about that one? Because it's so boring, repeating and repeating and repeating just because there's a technical or something or other. In the meantime, someone's come up with a better gag than the one that had been written, that had probably been fought over for three hours in a room somewhere, you know, and Rick's eventually said, no, we're doing that. And then as a throwaway ad lib while waiting to shoot again, suddenly, something else has cropped up. And so no doubt that, 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 that sort of thing probably happens a lot and well, it does happen a lot. We realise that even though everyone might feel a bit under-rehearsed and scared after a week, it was better just to go for the week and, and keep the freshness. Do you, do you find me boring or something? Look, look, that's a saucer. <laughs> that's boring. The way it would generally work is that we'd come in for a read-through in... Um, North Acton and at which point we would realise that the scripts were about an hour and a half when they were supposed to be 30 minutes um, and then um, I would usually stay up most of the night um, usually with Rick cutting it down and in order to get something that was vaguely workable for the next day and then you know we would we would rewrite all the way through rehearsals and we had a, we had a week for each episode and um, and then we would um, go into the studio. There was a moment when I think the four of them were squeezing onto a couch in one of the episodes I directed. I think it was boring. <laughs> no room for me on the sofa as usual. I have to sit on the rickety chair. And there was a silence. And one of them, and I think it was Rick, suddenly went, hmm. And it was the funniest sound that we'd ever heard. That was a loud one. We all work in television. We're supposed to be above all that. But it was the funniest moment. I think it stopped us for about half an hour. We couldn't do anything more. And it was in front of the audience as well. The audience absolutely pissed themselves. Because it was just something that had happened. And, and, and for some reason, it was the funniest thing. And it, of course, the problem was that the more we tried to shoot that scene, the more they laughed. And the clock kept coming round to the time when you have to lose the studio. And of course, it was it was much more controlled then, so you couldn't shoot beyond ten o'clock at night, and we would almost always get in danger of overrunning because they were quite long and complicated. And eventually, our laughter turned to tears as we squeezed. They were all so difficult to do that you there was a ten o'clock finish time, and you never finished much before ten o'clock because there were complicated things that had to be done. And I saw 10 o'clock coming near and near and thought, I'm never going to get this in, I'm never going to get this in. And of course, in those days, if you went one minute over, one minute, if, if the clock went one minute over, everybody would be plunged into the most horrific overtime. And then there would begin, you know, protracted negotiations, you know, between the gallery and the VT editors down below, whether we could have an overrun for 10 minutes or 15 minutes or whatever. And sometimes they'd just pull the plug and... You know, and that would be that, or you wouldn't get everything in. So it was you always felt really panicky and really pressurised. In the first series, I was a, a assistant floor manager, which is really in charge of props and um, all things uh, picked up and moved by actors, which was a lot actually: bricks, crowbars, mallets, swords, sledgehammers, pickaxes, boots. You know, that kind of run-of-the-mill stuff, and. Um, and then in the second series, I became the production manager, which in those days was sort of like a, a floor manager, a first assistant, a location manager, and unbelievably, an accountant. Um, I wouldn't be trusted with some of those jobs now, but that's sort of what I did. So you became, I kind of became Paul Jackson and Jeff Posner's kind of right-hand man. At the BBC, cutely in those days, there was a little 
cloth panel dividing the editing suites. They were all buried away down in the basement. And so if you were editing one programme and sport was next door, all you could hear was the horse's hooves going round. You couldn't hear your own programme. Suddenly our programme was drowned out by these shouts and screams and explosions. And I wandered next door, curious as I was, of course, uh, and found that Paul was editing uh, The Young Ones, Pilot. Now, we'd known that Paul was doing that, and, of course, we were all very interested because he was using Rick Mail and uh, Adrian Edmondson and people that we'd heard of in the comedy store. But when I took one look at the pilot, I said to Paul, this is absolutely wonderful, Paul. This is fantastic. And he said, well, I don't know whether it'll get the series, but if the series happens, would you like to work on it? And I said, yes, of course. In hindsight, one of the most difficult shows have ever done because there's so much in it. There was so much action and so much comedy in it. You know, much, much more than you would get in any normal show. It was like a bullet train of stuff going on all the time. So in order to keep ahead of it and keep up with it, you had to have somebody like Paul or Jeff in charge to try and, you know, just get the stuff physically done. And so the learning curve is sort of like that. We didn't consciously think, let's put in extreme violence. I think it was just what made us laugh were... You know, people getting hurt, people hurting other people, people doing embarrassing things. So that's what we concentrated on. It was just, um, yeah, just a sort of infantile and warped sense of humour. Everything was kind of prepared. Nothing was really left to chance. Couldn't really afford to. There was too many dangerous stunts going on all the time. There was a sort of order to the chaos, obviously, otherwise people would have started getting hurt. You can't make a show that appears as wild and anarchic as that while being wild and anarchic. You know, it's a, it doesn't work like that. There were the odd accidents. <laughs> but... Um... Legally, I don't think I'm allowed to talk about that. <laughs> I don't think any, any, no one got killed or went to hospital or lost limbs. And, um, you know, there were the odd um, cuts and bruises and damage to property. But apart from that, it all went pretty well. Even when we threw a bus over a cliff. Look out! Cliff! There was a bus sequence at the end of the last very last episode where the bus goes over a cliff having gone through a poster of Cliff Richard and the stunt driver his name I can't remember now but the way he did it is that he just wired the throttle down to the floor and just let off the clutch and when he thought it was right he jumped out of the bus and it went over the cliff he was mad I'm quite sure he's dead I'm quite sure he's dead there's a bit where I fire a shotgun and it's a bit of a blank, but it was, you know, still like a, a pump action shotgun with a full charge in the shell, you know. And I remember firing the first one up into the roof and I come in, this Brian Damage. It's like, you know, no, you know, it's like dust and stuff came down from the lights, you know. And I think, well, I've got another five of these, in, <laughs> you know. And uh, no wonder, you know, everybody acted frightened. There was a giant eclair that landed on the cast, and it must have fallen down four times in rehearsal. Nobody will thank me for this story. It must have fallen down four times in rehearsal, kept hitting the actors on the head. I can think, you know, sooner or later, one of them's going to break their nose. The only thing I can remember going seriously wrong was when the 10-foot eclair fell on my head during University Challenge, um, which was a difficult one to explain, going to the osteopath the next day, because we're all sitting up there in University Challenge, and of course, because I'm the tallest, I took the full weight of a, of a chocolate eclair on my head, which was a, you know, that's a, that's a terrible thing to happen to someone. There's a moment when I think uh, Adrian was throwing a Molotov cocktail and the end fell off, and he just sat there, having delivered his line, and his, the back of his head, I guess, was on fire. I mean, health and safety was fairly <laughs> flexible sometimes. I mean, that shot where the cooker blows up, there's only like 12 frames of it because they'd put too much explosive in there. We didn't use electronic techniques, except once, I believe, when the cooker exploded, uh, it 
rips in slow motion like that as he pulls back from it because we weren't expecting such a big explosion. And um, I think Paul wanted to get the most out of it, which was Rick genuinely trying to escape getting his face burnt off. Suppose we should just have to cook our own supper. We saw the effect, the amazing effect of this flame coming up and Rick's face like that. Because it's real, because I think he thought I'm at a safe distance. He's too near. They wouldn't let him do it nowadays. I remember, you know, explosions in the studio being so big that I had to sort of waft my, the dust out of my face to try and get to an audience to explain what was happening next. Aid hurt himself once or twice. He had to bite a brick that was um, exploded in his face and it was made of rivita and filled with muesli and it was sort of had air, pressurised air in it and that, um, you know, but everyone get little cuts from time to time. But the special effects guys would always do it themselves first. And of course they were always covered with little cuts as well, so it wasn't that reassuring. It was a time when the BBC still had this incredibly bountiful uh, craft services situation where you had visual effects and sound guys and lighting guys of the camera people, editors of the highest order. And The Young Ones was a show that made the greatest demands on costume and makeup and visual effects and everything. And they were all there in the BBC. You don't have to go and find them. They were around the corner in the East Tower. The visual effects department were very good. They knew what they were doing. They made frying pans that you could smack somebody around the head with on any angle and it would be OK. I mean, the good thing about them being quite young performers, <laughs> they could take a level of pain possibly a bit higher than in their later life. Do we hit people with real cricket bats and real chairs? No, it was, they were, it, there was a fantastic special effects team. Trash! I think you'll find that was specially designed to fall apart like that. They were, you know, they would actually bring in things and say, <clears throat> I don't know if you can use this, but we've got a kettle that can explode or we've been working on, you know, a baseball bat you can hit someone in the face with. And there were also fantastic sound effects people. Dubbing that sound on, that's never real. <laughs> Who prided themselves on doing them live and not using any of the records, but kind of using, you know, their armpits and strange bits of their body and clanging things together. They worked out ways of hitting each other in the bollocks with cricket bats so that it didn't quite hurt as much as it should. Uh, and then we ran in live sound effects too, which is, I think was a first at that time. So if Rick, for instance, said, got smacked in the bollocks with a cricket bat it's more effective if you can hear the smacking noise when he says ha ha missed both my legs <laughs> <laughs> missed both my legs the frying pan effects were nearly always done live so the audience could hear them which meant great skill somebody had to press a button the moment the frying pan hits the head and i remember there was a they called them deputy sound supervisors whose job it was to generate all the sound effects found a very interesting effect by putting a microphone next door to his baby's bottom. And I can leave you to understand what sound effect that generated. The violence in The Young Ones is, um, is very much cartoon violence. They never bled or had a bruise. And, and even when um, Vivian's head was severed from his body and pumped blood from, you know, for a bit, which was probably the you know the most gruesome thing we did. It wasn't upsetting violence. We had a we had an intellectual debate about Tom and Jerry cartoon violence. It's not real. Chops off his finger. It's back the next frame. But it was we had all this argument prepared. It was barely debated. All that cartoon violence actually kind of works because in cartoons people get smashed to pieces and then four seconds later they're all right again. And there was a level of that going on a lot in the young ones. I mean. Well, obviously, otherwise they'd all be dead. The great thing that kept the feeling, I think, of, of anarchy and like an invasion was that the special effects were crap, really. I mean, and, and I don't mean they were incompetently executed. They were sort of deliberately crap. The animations worked because they were so low-tech, I think. If you're going to make a joke which goes, uh, I don't know, why don't you watch Roger Bannister, and then the Bannister starts giving you an answer, you can't have a particularly sophisticated prop to match the particularly unsophisticated gag, you know. And so SPG was another character. He was just like a disgusting hamster. Nobody, I think, ever really believed he was a real one, but, you know, it was sort of because, for me, it was great SPG because he sort of felt like a 
on acid version of something from Tales of the Riverbank, which is, you know, in keeping with the programme, I think. They wrote it that way. They wanted, they wanted the script to be full of surprises, changes of direction, things that would, that would happen in conversation that suddenly you'd see in real life. We had puppets, you know, at various times, and in the first series um, they were made by a man called Marcus Kimber, and in the second series it was um, David Claridge, who at the same time had a new creation called Roland Rat. <laughs> So that's the link between the young ones and Roland Rat. People were going around having young ones nights, so they were playing all six episodes back to back because VHSs had been invented at this time, as I just said. So people were recording these shows on VHS and watching them, and we thought, well, we'd give those people, these real hardcore fans, a little treat. We'll drop flash frames, you know, just what we call flash frames, just a little completely irrelevant picture into... Normally they're an editing mistake. It's when you leave a frame in that shouldn't be there. We just had this idea that it would be fun to mess with people um, in new ways. So we had this idea of putting in little three second or three frame flashes from time to time in the second episode. On VHS, which was a new thing at the time, they'll try and freeze frame it, they'll try and stop it. So that's what we did. All through the, the, the six half hours of the second series, we dropped in flash frames. We started at four frames which is very easy to see and actually reasonably easy to freeze, and we cut it down to one frame over the three or four shows. And they were, and they were just completely random images taken from, from a film library or something. I think one was a rusty tap and uh, one was a frog. There was a whole Western shootout scene. One had writing on it, but I can't remember what it said. And it certainly wasn't saying, you know, you know go out and, you know, swear at your teachers or anything like that. We dropped them in and the, the intended punchline to all this was on the last show we were going to put up a, a whole dense written caption which said something like, uh, th this is what, uh, uh, sorry, did you think there was any point to this? Uh, you, you wanker, this is the young ones, what a plonker, yeah. I suppose there, there is a certain uh, delight in doing completely pointless things and being allowed to do them on television. You know, that's, uh, so I suppose... Um, contrary to what I was just saying, you know, those little uh, flashes, at, at least they served, you know, some purpose in that they were completely and utterly pointless then. Unfortunately, what happened was John Lloyd, who was a good friend of mine at the time, was a BBC producer who'd done Not the Nine O'Clock News, and he and I had actually been in the uh, adjacent edit suites when we were doing the first series of The Young Ones, had by this time moved on to doing Spitting Image on ITV, and he'd had a major battle with a man called... Norris McGuerta, who was a right-wing commentator, and he'd, uh, they'd done a sketch about him. Norris got very angry, sued, and there was a big row going on. And in an episode, they had put a flash frame of a, a naked woman's body with Norris McGuerta's head transposed onto it, lying out in a kind of Venus de Milo pose. And McGuerta had gone berserk. There was a great furore about it because it was supposed to be a way of subliminally influencing people or something. He had discovered that in commercial television, uh, it was illegal to use flash frames because they were a form of uh, secret advertising. It was believed that if you flashed up the Coke sign, it was like subliminal advertising. So you weren't allowed to do it in ITV. And on that technicality, he had, I think, brought a lawsuit. He'd certainly caused a lot of trouble for spitting image. Um, and so, uh, and in fact, John had, uh, as a second flash frame, put up a thing in Spitting Image saying, this is actually a technical editing area called a flash frame, but Paul Jackson thinks it's very funny and he's doing it. It was all just nonsense going on. But there's a huge complaint about it. And our, our shows were on the air at the same time. And uh, although it wasn't illegal at the BBC because the commercial issue didn't arise, it was raised and it went up to Bill Cotton, who's a good long-time friend of mine still to this day. But at that time, he was my boss, boss, boss. And the edict came down. Uh, you've got to take it out. And I said, you can't. It's the whole point. That Paul, stop arguing. It's got to come out. So it's on the DVDs, it's on the video versions, but it never was broadcast. As far as the public are concerned, it was one of those, it was one of those things that kind of grows from, from, from small roots. I mean, the, the actual viewing figures were tiny. First series averaged about two and a half million viewers, which in those days was pretty low, really. It wasn't appalling for BBC Two, but it was on the low side. Now it will be about average. Um... But it was clear that it was absolutely targeting the audience it was aimed at. We were quite surprised um, by the reaction when it first went out because we'd somehow imagined that the, um, 
the audience would be people like us. They'd you know be people in in their early twenties or you know between sort of you know eighteen and thirty. And actually, our big fan bases were were school children, quite young school children, whose parents would quite often write us irate letters. Don't you realise the way you act is influencing millions of children to talk Cockney and be insubordinate? Oh come on, sir, don't be silly. We're the only kids in Britain who never say. It's what kind of audience? So it's a kind of active audience that tells its friends <laughs> and, and builds that way. There were certain people who said, this is very new, and there are people who are new to television, um, so we should give it a chance. But I think most people thought it really puerile. Representing Scumbag, we have Mike, uh, Prick, what? Vivian. <laughs> oh, I wish I'd had time for a crap before we started. What was happening was that a whole younger generation were latching onto a programme that was on at nine o'clock at night. It wasn't on at half past five in the afternoon where they had their slot, but on in adult television. And of course, if you were at university, this was the programme to see. So there was the sort of split between, which is probably more to do with age and background rather than necessarily whether they liked it or not. Many, many more people would watch it from tape rather than watch it live. Rewind to beginning of tape and press play. Happy viewing. Ha, ha, ha! They wouldn't say that if they knew what video we've got. It was to the huge advantage of that programme, probably more than any other, that VHS recorders had been invented and marketed. Because if the programme had come out three or four years earlier, nobody would have been able to have recorded the programme and kept it and kept viewing it. And then, you know, today it's file sharing. In those days it was... You know, you share your VHS. People who wrote television reviews and would write about drama programmes one day and then comedy programmes the next didn't really hook onto it very much. It quickly, word of mouth, very, very quickly spread this programme and then it got picked up in the press. And, I mean, there was so much stuff in the, in the newspapers about it, in, in the red tops mainly. I think the broadsheets just simply didn't know what to make of it and so probably ignored it. The only adverse reaction would have come from people who just don't like the show and, you know, I think you probably classify people like Mary Whitehouse and people like that. Uh, she probably got into a bit of a tiz about the Tampax thing but probably couldn't bring herself to say the word. Yeah. Yeah, although we were surprised the amount of people who did who we didn't think would like the show. It was really huge with, with policemen and I don't know why. The policeman said, I've got to go. I said, why? So I've got to get back to the station to watch my favourite programme, The Young Ones. So when I told Rick, he was devastated. He said, the pigs, watching this, this is a terrible, terrible day. <laughs> right, the music's too loud. The neighbours have been complaining. <laughs> you just watch your steps, Sonny. <laughs> The more perceptive and intelligent members of the audience got it pretty quick and realised that this was really good. And some journalists, well, I say some, I think one. There was a, there was a guy called Ray Connolly. He was the TV critic for the Evening Standard, and he wrote, he'd always disliked me. I think it, either they called me as funny as a funeral either before or in his review. You fell for the oldest trick in the book, the old strange parcel routine. But he said something really interesting. He said, there's something going on in my house. He said, my kids are sneaking off to watch this show that I don't understand at all, called The Young Ones. And yet they find it hilarious. I, I don't get it. But clearly, it was like this, this idea that something was going on. And I think he almost made the analogy, because, of course, Ray came through as a writer in the 60s music generation I was talking about. I think he almost made the analogy to, you know, we had our music, this feels to me a bit like that, like we had the Stones, they've got the young ones, which was fantastic. I can remember the critics' reaction to the second series, which I thought was actually better made and more, you know, more robust and funnier. Um, and the, the, the reaction of the critics to the second series was oh, we've seen it all before, they've sold out, this is no good, forget it, go home, everyone, they're rubbish. I think there was a feeling that the talent that had been found on Series 1 was starting to do stuff for the other channel and that the BBC wanted to make sure that they held on to them and I think they couldn't get them because there was... 
if I remember rightly, there was a series of comic strips being made which used similar kinds of people. And so we had to wait until that had been finished shooting before series two could begin. So I think that probably there were a whole host of things. And of course, having shot the comic strip as well, there was a lot more knowledge from the people who made the programme about how television works. So if you do notice any difference between one and two, I think it's probably because series one was very much a learning curve for everybody, cast and crew, on how this was going to be. And by the time you got to series two, people were a little more comfortable and, and that affected the writing too. Look, here comes the postman! <laughs> Vivian, why do you keep telling us what's just about to happen next? Because it's a studio set, Michael, and they can't afford any long shots, you see. He said always says that, um, you know, when they wrote it, they, they didn't know that you could jump in time. So everything like the first series is continuous. <laughs> you know, they didn't, they didn't, you know, they didn't think you could go to next week. And so the first series are all sort of in real time. I think the second season, the, um, the writing had improved in the, 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 the structure, just the structure of the, of the stories. And there was more confidence in some of the routines. The first series, we were feeling our way. We were trying to trying to put a style and a shape on it that really derived from what we had to play with. I think by the time Series 2 had written, everybody kind of knew how to do it. And so uh, I think Paul directed all of the second series himself, which meant that they were probably, strangely enough, a bit more careful in writing Series 2. When you do one series and you do a second one, you find out things that didn't work in the first that you fix and try and either eliminate or improve in the second then you see that things that work well in the first you do more of in the second so you hone it I mean that's the nature of the beast so there were things obviously in the first series that didn't appear in the second some of the more surreal stuff I think went by the wayside um, not all of it I'm afraid the surreal stuff is like you know you suddenly cut the two men on a raft or they were in Arctic Russia or and some of the puppetry I think might have had less of a high profile <laughs> in the second series. It's a bloody game any day. What is chess? Once the writers, Ben, Lisa and Rick, had seen the first series, they would have seen where the areas needed working work and, and fixed it in that area. Everybody was, was more aware of, of who they were and what they were doing. Series 2 has loads of really great comedic moments in it. And I think probably they learned through writing series one what worked and put most of them into series two. The bit I enjoyed the most was the day when we got set free and we went on the bus and uh, Neil got to wear those little John Lennon specs and play the guitar and we were wide-bottomed anarchists. Coming out of the bank having done the bank raid and looking for the car and robbing the car and getting in that and then getting in the bus and, and all of that. That's, that's what I remember as being the sort of the most enjoyable day, I think. And then watching a real London bus fall over and explode. That was, that was a good day. That bit where he, he starts playing the, 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 the uh, University Challenge theme and they all start dancing. It was just after the funniest f***ing thing I've ever seen in my life, because I wasn't expecting it. <laughs> the best memories are moments involving the leading characters, not in the, in, in the peripheral stuff. So Nige sitting on the loo with a noose contemplating suicide. And you know Rick pulling out the tampon with 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 Jennifer there and all that. I mean they're, they're great comic moments. What do you do with it? <laughs> no, don't tell me. Don't tell me. I'll guess. <laughs> it's a telescope. <laughs> a telescope with a mouse in it. <laughs> the council worker always made me laugh a lot. Her her reaction when she saw Rick on the cross and when Neil came up with a lentil stew. The road safety advert piss take was, was great fun. Partly because it, it was a set piece and it was just me and it was to camera. It was also something we could get absolutely right because we, we did it as a, a, a pre-filmed a pre insert because you couldn't do that in front, of a, in front of a studio audience. So I went into the BBC on the, the day before the, 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 the recording or whatever and just, just on my own and we just kind of did it. We had to do it a couple of times because I'd smashed the sponge cake and bits of cake would go all over the lens. And, 
and the crew would be pissing themselves since we have to do it again. So that, and it was just a very, very funny piece because it was so on the moment and because it was because it was quite close to the actual <laughs> advert that we were, we were taking the piss. <laughs> and it's blind. And this cricket bat with a freeze block nailed to it is your car. Now, what happens if your car mounts the pavement? <laughs> think once. Think twice. Think, don't drive your car on the pavement. Most of the funniest things that happened were when we were on location. We, we filmed the pilot episode in London, and then <clears throat> after that we decided to move it down to Bristol. And... Um, in fact, I was talking to Ed By about this the other day. We were, we were reminiscing about a time that we shot a, a scene which for some reason everything had to be covered with snow and they just went and sprayed a whole street with fake snow. About half an hour into the sequence, two people turn up with Sainsbury's bags looking around and we said, and you are, what, how can we help you exactly? We're the BBC. And he said, well, that's my house. And then we realised I'd pointed to the wrong house. And in fact, we should have been in a completely different house. And I remember somebody, she said, who's responsible here? And I, I was wearing a cap at the time, and I could see people going, talk to the man in the cap, as I was trying to get it off my head and hiding it in my shirt. Too late. They were very nice about it after we'd paid them a phenomenal amount of money. Paul jumping into a muddy into a muddy puddle springs immediately to mind, actually. Nigel was uh, on a horse, and he had to fall off the horse into a puddle. And he was being very precious about, oh, I'll hurt myself if I fall over, and I don't want to. Do. And I just lost it. Paul's got a very sort of short temper. That's what he's very famous for. F*** this, f tell him to f*** oh, f it. And I stormed out the control room, marched up the hill to this puddle that he was supposed to be falling into, said to him, for fuck's sake, Nigel, just fall backwards into the bloody puddle. And he said, I don't get what you mean. He was winding me up. And I said, oh, for fuck's sake. And I threw myself backwards into this puddle, which was deeper than I had imagined. And I was completely drenched in dirty, muddy water. And I had a terrible hangover anyway. And then had to spend the entire rest of the day on location dressed in... Uh, the clothes of a medieval peasant, which were the only dry clothes that anyone could find. I have one. Can you tell me what's happened to the rest of the street? That was quite funny. Wow, I really hope we don't have a crash. There's always the potential to come back, although we didn't have any intention of coming back. But we, you know, we did kill them all off at, in a plane crash at the beginning of the first episode of the first series, and. So I think, you know, we could have always found a way around it. I think that second series would have been a hard act to follow, to be honest. And, uh, and also, by that time, all those people were ready to burst out and do other things. Rick's line was really encapsulated at, if there was only 12, 40 towers, why would I presume to do more? We never planned to do um, more than two series, although I do... Um, I do sometimes think we should do the middle-aged ones and see what's happened to all of them. If it wasn't for the young ones, I'd so probably be, well, let me see, uh, probably be unemployed, not very good in television, or dead, but not, uh, you know, not a producer and a director um, of the kind of stuff I'm doing. It all spawned from the young ones, uh, I, uh, and Paul Jackson. Who's, who you know led me onto Red Dwarf and Bottom and stuff like that, which really helped my career. It's a series that's that's memorable to do, really memorable to do. Um, memorable, memorable just in looking back on what we achieved. It just makes me smile sits in here talking about that. Um, that uh, you know you, you, that if nothing else, you know there is one little thing that you can always have on celluloid, which which you'd always be proud of being part of. You know. It's, uh, so yeah, it's just nice to have that as a kind of little bit of a, a memory of, of when all those those days when everything just seemed to be kind of like a happening thing, which was great. What the young ones means to me now is well, it's such a long, it's all gone blurry. Like I said, it's such a it's a very long time ago, um, but it, I've got very fond memories of it and of all the people involved. Um, it was a very exciting time. 
Um, but I suppose I can't separate it up in my mind from the, from the comic strip, which was also going on simultaneously at the same time with the same group of people. So in, in my mind, they're all part of the same, you know, the same era, really, from about 1980 to 1987, I'd say. One of the funnest parts of my life, my first BAFTA, um, uh, some very good old friends that went through something together that, that means something still to this day, and it gives me enormous pleasure to still hear young comics come through and say, I'm in this business because I saw the young ones. That gives me tremendous pleasure every time somebody says it to me.